Uh, for day two, uh, I'm Bill Warren. I'm introducing our first speaker, Jim Todd, uh, also from Ohio State. And um, I just want to say that, that the, this morning's uh, speakers, right, are really, you're going to hear the state of the art on what people in vision science think about the perception of shape and space. There's a lot of confusion in vision science, as we, as we already have run into. And I think the, the Jim and Jan are the people who've done the most to kind of clarify what the heck is going on and how strange our spatial appearances can be. So um, Jim, you're going to speak on, is there a consistent geometry of visual space? And why should judgments of 3D structure be systematically distorted? For those of you students in the room, I, my advice is never use a title this long. Uh, if you do, the organizers will just arbitrarily truncate it like they did in this particular case in the abstract book. Uh, let me say I want to thank Declan and Alex and Gary for organizing this meeting. Uh, I think it's uh, really been an interesting one, and I'm looking forward to do it today. Uh, in my talk today, I want to carry on uh, some of the themes that came out in the talks yesterday. And I want to start with a slide. Um, I'm going to show this to you several times during the talk, which sort of talks about the three domains that uh, we need to worry about if we're talking about visual perception. So two of these we've already heard a lot about. So we have physical space. Uh, in Susanna's talk, she refers to these as mind-independent properties, the idea that there is a world that's separate from our um, phenomenal experience of the world. Uh, there's visual space, which is our phenomenal experience. And there's another domain that I'll be talking a lot about a little later in the talk, um, which we didn't hear that much about yesterday, but I'll spend a lot of time on today, which is patterns of sensory stimulation, which from my point of view is the glue that holds these two things together. Um, now, my talk is divided into three parts, all right? So the first two are going to be concerned with sort of formal geometry of how one might conceptualize uh, visual space from a mathematical point of view. Um, and then the, the last third will deviate. So in the first part of the talk, what I'm going to consider is the formal mapping between physical space and visual space. Right? Can we build a geometry that relates those two things in some interesting and meaningful way? In the second part, I'm going to talk about a different kind of geometry. This would be the geometry for solipsists. All right? So let's look at the formal structure of visual space, irrespective of how it might be related to the visual world. So um, and I'm going to call this intrinsic geometry. So it's a very different meaning of the word intrinsic than what you were referring to. And I'll explain where it comes from in a little bit. Uh, but the idea here is what we're looking at is how people's spatial judgments relate to each other, not how they relate to the physical world. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third part of my talk, I'll talk about patterns of stimulation, how they're determined by physical space, and how they in turn determine our phenomenal, uh, phenomenal awareness of space. So let's start, since we're going to talk about the geometry of uh, space, let's spend a little bit of time talking about geometry. Um, this is the geometry we all learned when we were in high school. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate. Um, uh, back when my dad was a kid, uh, they learned Euclidean geometry in high school. They also learned spherical geometry. Right? They had to do away with that when they started teaching calculus in high school. Right? So the only geometry we learn about is Euclidean geometry. And it really ties our hands. Right? It's, it's really too bad that we don't have more of an education like that. Um, so for 2,000 years, this was sacrosanct. Right? Euclidean geometry was given by God. If you questioned it you know, in the 15th century, you might get executed by the pope or something. The, um, but around the beginning of the 19th century, um, people started realizing that this is not the only possible geometry. There are lots of alternative ways of thinking about geometry. And at around that time, people started again to think about, well, all right, as these geometries start creeping up like weeds, is there some principle that we can tie them all together? 
And there are a couple of principles that people worked out, and I'm going to tell you about two of them today. So let me start by beginning with Euclidean geometry is often described as looking at properties of figures that do not change over translations and rotations. Now that's a bit of an exaggeration. Euclidean geometry also allows for similarities of things that have the same shape um, but are not perfectly identical to one another, but it's close enough for government work. Um, so one generalization of geometry came about by uh, Felix Klein. Uh, this is when he gave his inaugural lecture coming a professor at Erlanger University, and he gave what's now called his Erlangen program, where he laid out a, a, a program for how you might relate different geometries to one another. And so Klein's idea was is to generalize the notion of geometry by considering properties that remain invariant over a wider range of transformations. Now, he formalized all this in terms of group theory. We don't have to worry about that here. It's just the idea if we can look at various kinds of transformations, some things change, some things don't. And uh, this makes it possible to relate different geometries to one another based on the varied properties they share in common. Now, one of the important things about uh, the Kleinian approach is that the geometries form a hierarchy. So for example, if you show something that's true in projective space, it automatically propagates down to other geometries like affine or projective space. So here's some examples of what we're talking about. Uh, Euclidean property, Euclidean transformation preserve length and angles. So if you translate or rotate something, the angles and lengths don't change. Uh, affine transformation preserve parallelism and the length ratios of parallel lines. So if I stretch an object, you prefer, preserve parallelism. Um, projective transformations preserve collinearity and cross ratios. If you don't know what a cross ratio is, don't worry about it. Uh, topological transformations preserve vertices and edges and their patterns of connectivity, the graph structure, if you will. Um, now, the this Kleinian approach is really convenient for looking at the relationship between physical space and phenomenal space, right? You've got a mapping from one to the other, and you can ask the question, what's invariant over that mapping? All right, so the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about some classic results that relate to this. Some of these were already mentioned by Gary yesterday. So the first one I want to talk about uh, is an experiment by Jan Kunderink. I hope you're not planning to talk about this one. Um, it has to do with the perception of straight lines in the environment. Remember, this is a projective invariant. Um, now, this slide is not from the experiment I'm going to tell you about. It's from a different experiment, but close enough. So the basic idea here, ignore this poll. Um, uh, let me back off a second. The first version of this that I've discovered was done by Ewald Herring in 1879. All right, now, whenever I talk about an experiment done in the 1800s or the early 1900s, it almost certainly was done by isolated points in total darkness. And that's not as crazy as it sounds. They weren't interested in visual space in the way that we're discussing here. They were interested in stereoscopic space. And so they did isolated points in the dark because they wanted to isolate stereo as the only source of information that was available for them to use. Uh, so that's what Herring did. Um, Bacho, Neto, and Rosenstraten, a uh, very important paper in the 1970s, were the first to start doing this in open field in broad daylight. And uh, the guy who, Jan Kunderink, has probably done 10 versions of this study using a variety of techniques. And uh, this, is, this is from Jan's lab. Uh, so the basic idea is, as I said, ignore this post. You've got two posts here and one marker here. And what the observer is told to do is adjust this little remote control robot. So this post is in the same visual direction as that one, and it's collinear with these two. All right, everybody clear on this? So what the observers are, are being asked to judge is tell me what a phenomenal straight line looks like. All right, pretty clear. Here's what the data show, both in Herring, Bacho et al., and Kundrick et al. 
if you do, oh, so this is Jan to do this. Has this ten thousand dollar laser rangefinder that uh, somehow he's able to buy off his funds, uh, <laughs> and this can um, measure the position of one of those rods with sub millimeter accuracy. I mean, really precise piece of equipment. Now, in order to do that, what you have to do is he needs an assistant uh, here to put a little mirror on top of that rod. This, by the way, is the weak link of this experiment uh, because the assistant can't position that mirror anywhere near with millimeter accuracy, but close enough for our purposes. So if you do this experiment, um, here are what the data look like. Uh, so this is uh, distance and depth in meters. This is distance in the frontal parallel uh, plane and meters, very extensive experiment. Uh, they looked at small visual angles, big visual angles. They looked at configurations that were near. They looked at configurations that were far. And this is what a straight line is, perceptually. All right? So the bottom line, if you ask observers to say what a straight line is, it's nowhere near a straight line. Now, there's another interesting aspect of this. Jan has done this experiment in at least three different ways. Uh, this is one, which is similar to the way that Herring did it. He also did a technique where imagine now I want to draw the same line <coughs> from Mark to Susanna, right? And you're at a pointer, and I, I adjust it so you point to Mark, and Mark points to you, all right? And I can measure a straight line done that way. Turns out if you do that, curvature's in the opposite direction. All right, so the distortions that you get, as we heard many times yesterday, depend on the particular way that you probe the subject uh, in order to measure the thing that you're doing. For purposes of my talk, though, the main thing I want you to get, no matter how you measure it, these phenomenal straight lines are not straight lines in the physical environment. That's important because what it means is that mapping from physical space to phenomenal space it's not projective, it's not affine, it's not Euclidean. <coughs> Here's another experiment. Gary mentioned this yesterday. This is the fam famous one by Hillebrand. This is later done by Blumenfeld. Uh, the same Batro group uh, did a similar thing. In this case, what observers are supposed to do is they set a line of bars so that they appear to be parallel straight lines. And they do this two different ways. In one case, they say, set these bars so they're parallel straight lines. The other one they do, set these lines so they all appear equidistant. Now, if you study Euclidean geometry, you know, of course, those two things are the same way. Why would you even bother running them differently? But it turns out you get different results. Uh, so especially in uh, Run in the Dark, which Hillebrand did, what you find is that these, um, these things curve outward and diverge inward, uh, and the distance alleys diverge more than the parallel alleys do. Uh, and this is important for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to go into great detail on that. If you do this in the open field, so that's very consistent in Hillebrand's study, where you're only dealing with points in the dark. You do it in an open field, you get a lot more variability. All right, so some subjects show the distance alleys outside the parallel alleys, other subjects show the other way around. This is a general trend we get in a lot of these studies, which is a little odd if you think about it. We get more variability in the open field than we do when we do isolated points in the dark. Uh, just to telegraph where I'm heading, uh, I think the reason for that is in the open field, we've got more sources of information we could potentially attend to. Uh, which allows for uh, more ways for subjects to do the task. Uh, here's another version of this. Again, parallelism is not preserved. Uh, straight lines are not preserved. The mapping from physical space to phenomenal space is not projective. It's not affine. It's not Euclidean. <coughs> um, here's another experiment. This is originally done by Hein. Ying talked about that. We heard several mentions of this. This is my version of the study. Um, I bought this nice, tasteful, flowered sheet. 
and we built an apparatus where we embedded a bunch of LEDs on here, which the computer could light up pairs of them. We would light pairs of LEDs, and the subject has a monitor over here. And what they had to do is, for each pair of LEDs, adjust a line that um, matched the length uh, between the two LEDs that they're looking at. And we heard a lot about different instructions. In this experiment, we didn't give them. We just said, match this line so it looks like it's the same length as the distance between the two LEDs. Um, now, some of the pairs were oriented in depth. Some of the pairs were oriented in the frontoparallel plane. Um, and here's what the data looks like. The ones that are oriented in depth are shown in the open circles. And as you see, um, Carl talked about this yesterday. Ying talked about this yesterday. As you get farther and farther, so if you take a given interval like this, right, as I move it farther and farther away, it appears squashed, shorter and shorter. So this is consistent with what Gary talked about, what Carl talked about, what Ying talked about. Um, if you look at the frontal parallel ones, they go in the opposite direction. The effect's not as you get over constancy. Uh, now this one, there's a lot of variation in the literature on. It really depends on the instructions. But in our study, uh, if you look at frontal parallel intervals, this looks like a smaller length um, than that does. All right, now two things to keep in mind here. Um, notice all these lengths are parallel with one another. The critical invariant of affine space is that the relative lengths of parallel line segments should be invariant. That's not happening. Uh, these results show that the mapping from physical to visual space is not affine. So just to conclude this section, straight lines in the environment are perceived as curved. Parallel lines in the environment are not perceived as parallel. Parallel lines of equal length in the environment are not perceived as equal. Uh, QED, it follows from these results that the extrinsic geometry, I'm sorry, that the extrinsic geometry of visual space is neither Euclidean, affine, nor projective. All right, question. yeah. When you say visual space and phenomenal space, you mean the same thing, right? Yes. Are there, are there any results where you get them to line up ever? Are there any tasks where you can get any of these to line up? Uh, which one? Are any of them, like where you get to see straight lines and they're perceived as straight under a certain task of a task reports? Um, generally, no. There are some odd observers that do it veridically. I mean, we heard from Carl yesterday, right? There are some conditions where, uh, at least in the frontal parallel case, um, if you do the instructions right for some observers, they, they get reasonable constancy. As a general rule, that's not what you get. Um, but there are a lot of individual differences when you do these tasks. And there are a lot of task differences if you probe them a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, so in line with that, what about blind walking, where there seems to be measured? Ask me that during the questions. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm happy to talk about that, the, uh, but not now. Okay. Um, all right, so let's move on now to a different way of combining these different geometries. Um, this was uh, due to uh, Bernard Riemann, who was the, uh, a student of Gauss and uh, replaced Gau uh, Gauss when Gauss retired, got his professorship. And at his inaugural lecture, uh, we really should do that in the U.S. I mean, it's really a nice custom in Europe. I mean, everybody gets dressed up in their gowns and the the new professor comes in and they give their best stuff. I mean, it really is a really nice tradition. Um, so when he was giving, he laid another coherent way of talking about different kinds of space. But in this case, the geometries are defined by how they are curved. All right. Now, this is often referred to as intrinsic geometry, and I'll define that in a second. Uh, but the basic idea is uh, suppose, well, let's do, a, let's do a quick demonstration. Um, so I'll pick on you, Declan. Is this curved? Yes. Is it planar? Or is it both? Uh, is it both simultaneously curved and planar? Planar meaning, just to find that for me. <laughs> you know what a plane is. I, yes, then. All right, is it curved? 
Yes. Is it planar? So wait. <laughs> what is the definition of a plane? <laughs> I think it's flat. Flat. It's not flat. Uh, it's intrinsically flat and not curved. Is it curved, planar, or both? It's extrinsically curved. Yeah. And intrinsically planar. All right. So imagine now that you're a, an incredible genius ant, <laughs> and you're crawling around on this surface, right? This, and you you made a triangle. The sum of the tri angles of the triangle would be 180 degrees. If you did that on a sphere, it would always be greater than 180 degrees. All right. So now the meaning of intrinsic in this case, why it's called intrinsic is that you can measure it without leaving the surface, right? It's also intrinsic. These are properties that are invariant under bending transformations. Now, Gauss was one of the great mathematicians of all time. And he proved this. He started by thinking of a surface as embedded in a higher dimensional space. But he ended up proving that you can tell this without leaving the surface. Now, Gauss was so pleased with this particular theorem that he gave it a name. He, thought, he called it his Theroma Egregium, which is Latin for remarkable theorem. <laughs> all right? Uh, again, you think of all the wonderful contributions that Gauss made, right? The idea that you can look at the curvature and get it intrinsically uh, was, was really a great discovery. And, and so... Um, as I said, uh, Riemann uh, developed this into a formal um, uh, way of combining different kinds of geometry. So if you have the geometry of a sphere, it's called the elliptic space. Geometry of a saddle is hyperbolic space. Gary mentioned that yesterday. Geometry of a plane is called Euclidean space. Uh, there are various intrinsic invariants here. The value of pi changes. Uh, Pythagorean theorem applies here, doesn't apply there. Um, now, this is very important in physics because if you're studying astronomy, you obviously can't get outside the universe. So whatever measures you take uh, to study the structure of the universe have to be done within the universe. Now, that, I raise this because we can do the same thing in visual space. All right? We can do completely intrinsic measures, not worry at all about how the judgments are related to the physical world, but we can study how those properties are related to each other. <clears throat> um, so again, just to put up this slide again here, now we're looking at visual space, phenomenal space, but we're going to look at it in isolation without worrying about how it contacts with the world. Now, the first purely intrinsic study was mentioned by Gary yesterday. Uh, one of my favorite studies ever done in psychology by A. A. Blank. Uh, in my opinion, absolute work of art. Uh, so here's the idea. Uh, so if you imagine you draw a triangle on a sphere, you get something to look like that. You draw it on a plane, looks something like this. You draw it on a saddle, it looks something like this. Um, now, uh, suppose I give the subject three points, and I tell them, bisect this side, bisect this side, bisect this side. And now you might ask the question, well, if I do the bisections, do these things bow outward? Do they bow inward? Are they actually straight? Um, now, unquestionably, Blank had that information at hand, right? He could have reported, but he didn't bother because he didn't care how the, subjects, how the judgments were related to the physical world. What he cared about was the question, once they did these bisections, is A, B... AB equal to capital A C, right? So if you were in Euclidean space, then this length would equal that length. If you're in elliptic space, this length is greater than that length. And if you're in a hyperbolic space, this space is less than that space. All right, now initially Blank did this in total darkness, as they all did in the classic studies. He was worried about stereoscopic space. Um, he found one subject who was a little bit weird, responded in a Euclidean way, but this particular subject kept asking him, are you trying to prove a theorem here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So apparently that subject behaved, but everybody else behaved this way. Um, Which way? Hyperbolic. As hyperbolic. Now, uh, the Batro, the South American group, did this in an open field. And they found that subjects now are a lot more heterogeneous. Right? About 60% of them uh, were hyperbolic, and about 40% of them were elliptic. So the data are not nearly as consistent in the open field as they are with isolated points in the dark. Um, so what Batro consisted is there's not a single uniform metric uh, for intrinsic space. Now, there's another experiment. I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on this by John Foley in 1972. What Foley was testing is whether visual space has this property. It's called free mobility. So the great for the Helmholtz, this was really important. He said, whatever properties visual space has, it has to have that. Right? So you imagine a triangle and you move it around. The shape can't change when you do that. And so that's what Foley was trying to test. Uh, this was done with points in the dark. I'll just go through this very quickly. Uh, the subjects have to construct two triangles. Um, right? So this is a right angle. This is a right angle. Uh, the experimenter doesn't set it. The subject does. Right? You adjust these two lines until it appears like a right angle. Uh, and you set the length so that this length appears the same as that. This length appears the same as that. This length appears the same as that. So by standard geometry of any of these geometries, actually, as long as you have constant curvature, uh, these should be uh, congruent triangles. And if that's the case, if we compare the two hypotenuses, right, E should look like it has the same length as F. It turns out that E appears about 25% longer than F. All right, and the implication of that is that ain't no uniform curvature in uh, intrinsic visual space. Uh, so about the 1970s, people, you know, all this excitement that started with blank was starting to dissipate. And um, uh, for many years, Jan and I would collaborate frequently. Uh, he'd come to my place one year, I would come to his. And one year I visited Utrecht, and uh, he came up with this idea of you know, maybe there's a, we can have a lower order geometry and look at the intrinsic structure of that. So could you have an intrinsic affine geometry or an intrinsic projective geometry? And so the question is, how can we test that? So I'll tell you about one of these experiments. And uh, the idea is to test a theorem that was first proven by uh, Pierre Verignon, who's a French mathematician. And so the theorem goes something like this. You take four arbitrary points in space, P1, P2, P3, P4. All right? And now the task is, what we want you to do is to bisect each of the segments of this quadrilateral. And so let's do that. We'll bisect those. You get something like this. And what Varignon proved is, it doesn't matter what the original four points are, you will always end up with a parallelogram by doing these bisections you sometimes referred to as Varignon parallelograms. Now the question is, if I'm studying this in visual space, how the hell do I know if that's a parallelogram or not? And so the way to do that is you bisect the diagonals of this thing. And if it's a parallelogram, those two bisections should be coincident with one another. All right, so this is an intrinsic procedure. We can study this using observer's judgments. Um, so this particular experiment was done uh, in Columbus in a virtual reality setup. The subjects see pairs of posts. They have to adjust another post to bisect it. And so we, we build the configuration over a sequence of these judgments. And here's what the data look like. So the, the dashed line here is the physical configuration. The, um, the solid line is the settings that the subject actually made. So these ellipses here are what are called uh, error ellipses. So these capture 95% of the, of the variance. And you'll notice there's a lot more variance in depth than there is in the frontal parallel plane. Um, also notice the straight lines map into curved lines, just like we've seen before. Uh, the bisection points aren't actual bisectors. 
because the near segment appears longer than the far segment, you have to shift the bisector toward the observer to get them to appear equal. But the key result of this is that if you now look at the bisection of the diagonals, they sit right on top of one another. All right? So what this suggests is that even though the extrinsic mapping from the physical world to visual space is not affine, the intrinsic structure may be. Now, we also did another experiment testing another theorem, uh, which is from Pappas of Alexandria. This is an experiment we did in Utrecht. A um, little bit more complicated than this one. I'm not going to go through the details, but the results... Oh, give me a break. 15. Uh, oh, okay, that's fine. The results came out uh, pretty much the same, saying that we do have an intrinsic... Um, projective structure. Now, I want to be really cautious in drawing a conclusion like that. We're talking two experiments here. Uh, we saw how the enthusiasm for blank would not get confirmed later. right? I, I would never conclude this without a lot more data. But it's at least an intriguing start. So let me, um, to just to summarize, visual space does not have a homogeneous distance metric. It may have an internally uh, consistent affine or projective structure, but the evidence of that is quite limited. So let me come back to this slide again. So what we've got is there are these weird distortions between physical and visual space, and how are we going to make sense of that? Now, where's Alex? Alex and I have conversations probably every week or so about this topic, and we, we talk about these kinds of experiments and the underlying math, and Alex gets really excited, and oh, this is really cool, and then at some point in the conversation, his eyes roll back in his head, he starts pulling out his hair, and he says, no, 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 <laughs> right? Visual space <laughs> has to be Euclidean. The world is Euclidean. We're grounded in the world. It has to be, right? Alex would have felt really at home in the 17th century when that was the, the, the prevalent view in mathematics, in lots of respects, actually. But uh, so the last part of the talk is for Alex. I'm going to try and explain why it is that it's not crazy um, and to deal with some of the points that Gary raised. Right? So why should our visual space be some distorted version of physical space. Now, the, the argument I'm going to make is that the glue that binds these things together is patterns of sensory stimulation. Now, I know in philosophy there's a... Philosophers have never been quite sure on how to deal with this. Uh, I've been quite pleased to hear the philosophers today talk about mind-independent properties. The, the idea that there are things outside of our mind that really do exist and we can know something about them. Uh, I know that has not historically been universal. Uh, Jerry Foda wrote a famous paper about 40 years ago. It had the strange title of uh, Methodological Solipsism as a Research Strategy for Cognitive Psychology. All right, now, the thesis of this paper was that um, there's no way in principle that we can bind our knowledge to the physical world. It just, it's just not possible. Don't even bother. And the reason why I reached that conclusion is he describes this in a very funny way. So he didn't recall this patterns of sensory stimulation. I don't know how long any of you have read that paper. He refers to them as um, sensory oracles. Right? It's like, you know, they give these vague pronouncements that you can interpret any way you want. But then he ends the paper in a really bizarre way. Right? In the last page he says, well, I'm not really a solipsist. I believe the world is out there and I have some knowledge of the world. Now, to me, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, so I don't know the subtleties of what you guys do, but that sounds to me like an argument by reductio ad absurdum. Right? If I'm convinced that there is a real world and I'm in some sense in contact with it, and my reasoning about how we study epistemology makes that connection impossible, then there's something wrong about the way that you're reasoning about epistemology. Um, 
Now, the alternative side of that is uh, James Gibson. Uh, Gibson was a functionalist. Uh, I have my own two quotes from Gibson. They're different from the ones that Gary used. Um, especially the first one I could make fun of it also is clearly wrong if you take it literally. Um, so the idea here is that, let me back up one sentence, patterns of simulation are caused um, by the structure of physical space. So physical space modulates the information that's affecting our sensors, right? And we're able to use that in order to drive some knowledge about physical space. So there are two aspects of this, and these are the quotes, or at least some aspect, uh, some variable stimulation, however difficult it may be to discover and isolate, which corresponds to a property of the visual world. Um, now this is clearly wrong. There are obviously properties of the visual world that we have no sensors for. So if you flooded this room with very, uh, radiation, we wouldn't know it until maybe our hair started to fall out. Uh, in that case, even Gary wouldn't know it then. Uh, but, um, and then the other aspect of this is for every aspect of a property of the phenomenal world of an individual, uh, there is a variable of energy flux that is reflect, uh, receptors, however complex, with which the phenomenal property would correspond if a psychophysical experiment could be performed. So those of us who, um, sort of reluctant to call myself a, a Gibsonian, the, uh, though I am in many respects, um, uh, use a technique called ecological optics. So you do a serious analysis of how it is that simulation is related to physical space, right? And then you run psychophysical experiments to try to determine when observers are making judgments, what the hell are the sensory properties on which those judgments are based? Um, let me give you a few examples. We'll deal with the curved lines. All right, remember, the original experiments were done in total darkness. So how's a subject going to know what a straight line is? Right? They can't go out with a string and pull it tight and say, all right, I'll put, pin it to your nose, and I'll pin it to your nose, and pull it tight, and that defines a straight line. They have to base it on some information that's available to them. And uh, at least in the early studies, that was structured. The only inf information that's available is binocular disparity. All right? Um, I'm not going to go into the details of binocular disparity, but the, uh, I'll just say very quickly, if you, if you look at the locus of points that all have the same binocular disparity, they define a curved arc, uh, which is concave in the direction of the observer, in precisely the same way that Jan and Herring found in their judgments uh, for what subjects say a phenomenal line. So at least a plausible explanation of that is what subjects are drawing a straight line. They're just setting a set of points that all have the same binocular disparity. All right, perfectly reasonable strategy to do. In fact, might be the only strategy to do if you have points in the dark. Um, that can also explain why distance intervals change. Right, so if I take a fixed interval like uh, this thing, right, and you look at disparity between the near point and the far point, right, as I move away, that disparity gets smaller. If we're using differences in disparity to judge uh, units of distance, you would expect, based on that, uh, that we'd get the same result that has been observed in many experiments. Now, in fairness, when you do this in the open field, there are a lot of other sources of information you could use, not just binocular disparity. Uh, here's another example, shape from texture. Actually, let me skip this. I'm running out of time. Uh, here's another one. Um, Jay Klein, what do you see here? Just dots. Just a bunch of dots. There's no structure. Um, how about now? <laughs> And then when I stop it, it slowly fades backward. All right? So this is a phenomenon that's referred to as structure from motion. Now it turns out there, there are algorithms available. You could calculate the Euclidean structure from this. In order to do it, uh, you need to take into account the relationships of at least three views. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this research, but it's pretty clear from the data 
that subjects never use more than two. And if you only have two views, this is a special case from small visual angles, uh, then all that's specified here is the affine structure. And um, um, so if you plot this out, what you can show with a little bit of simple math is that the depth of the point at any given instant equals the image plane velocity, dx dt, uh, divided by the rate of angular rotation. Now, the gist of this equation is that um, you can't tell the difference between a change in the rate of angular rotation and the change in depth, right? So if you're looking at me and I'm rotating my head back and forth, I could be moving it really fast with a squashed head, or I could be moving it really slow with an expanded head, and you can't tell the difference. Now, that may sound strange to you, but let me show you a demonstration that shows that is indeed the case. Um, Mark, what do you see? I see a rotating ellipse or something. Uh, is it rotating at constant velocity? No. All right. So this is what you see. Is that close? So the front view on the left, the top view on the side, does that fit your perception? They're similar. All right. Now here's another version where you get the same rotating helix, but in this case it's doing that. All right. Now, there isn't such a compelling definition. There's no way in principle you can tell them apart. All right. The motion information is telling you part of the structure, but there's other parts that are just inherently ambiguous. And so the question we'll want to ask is, well, how do you know what that is? Jan invented a term. He calls it the observer's share. If you do the ecological optics, it's specifying part of the structure, but there's another part that just not, you got to make something up. Here's another example of the same thing. This is what's called bas-relief ambiguity. Daclon, they look like identical heads. Mm -hmm. What if I told you they're not? I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I obviously roped you in. Here's what they are in this case. All right, so the idea is that um, uh, if you have patterns of shading under appropriate set of assumptions, Right? If this is what you have, there's a family of shapes that are associated. These two things produce exactly the same image over here. Part of the structure is specified by the ecological optics. Part of it, you just got to make something up, the observer's share. So I want to end with, let's talk about very briefly what the properties, how you get the observer's share. Now, according to Gibson, you get it from what he referred to as environmental constraints, right? Uh, let me show you an example. Uh, who shall I pick on this time? Uh, Susanna, tell me what you see here. Um, the right one is smaller than the big one. Uh, I mean, the right one is smaller <laughs> than, the, than the left one. So this one's bigger than that one? Yes. If I told you they were the same size, would you? I would absolutely believe you. <laughs> can, I, so, can I, I sell I, you a bridge? Well, and I can see that the, the, they, they fill out the same amount of little thingies at the bottom of little. Um... All right, so for Gibson, the key source of information here is this idea that uh, you have this contact with the ground. This was a key. So Gibson had what he called it's one of the real central principles of Gibson. He called it a ground theory. Things sit on the ground. All right, so I can be talking to you right now. I could be a little Lilliputian Jim Todd. Right? It was, Don't you like I have a high voice if I did that? But, um, and of course, I do this in the movies all the time. It's a technique called forced perspective. Let me show you what this really looks like. This is a variant of a study that Gibson did in the 1950s. Right, so even now you know what's going on, you still see this is bigger than that one. All right, so again, exploiting this contact. Let me show you an even stranger one. Uh, this is a sculptor by a Belgian artist, Matthew uh, 
Haymakers, is that how you pronounce it? Haymakers. Um, what do you see there? Yeah, David Ilbert, the mathematician. <laughs> uh, it looks like an impossible triangle. <laughs> okay. Now, this information is telling you this is impossible. Now, there are configurations which are possible, mm -hmm. um, but you don't bother seeing them. So you ask that question. Okay, I, I, give, me, give me four minutes. Um, here's what it really is. All right. Now, the constraint here is an interesting one. Um, basically, the rule is if you see a straight line in the optical projection, you're not even going to consider the possibility that it's curved in the world. Now, in projective geometry, there's no reason why you would assume that. But in the real world, right, the odds of you being right in that assessment uh, are almost 100% accurate. Right? The only way you'd get fooled by this is if somebody, like this sculptor, is intentionally trying to do it. Let me show you one. Uh, here's another example of uh, Hummakers. This is a video animation. So this now is an impossible cube. All right, now what he's going to do is he's going to take that cube, rotate it, so you see it moving in real time. That's what it really is. And then he moves it back. You know what it is, but it still looks like an impossible cube. Right, so that constraint, straight lines in the projection, means straight lines in the world. Uh, you, you really can't override that. I'll show you one more and then I'll quit. This is one of my favorite all-time illusions. Some of you have probably seen this before. Um, this is uh, the Ames Room. How many of you have seen an Ames Room before? Uh, in, in real life or pictures? Yeah. They have one at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. And now, the usual explanation of this, which is complete nonsense, is that, well, observers through experience, they know that rooms are rectangular. And uh, that's why they experience this illusion. But and then I ask you the question, what the hell is more likely, a non-rectangular room <laughs> or a person who shrinks by 50% when they walk from one position to another? Um, <laughs> So something more basic is going on here, and the, the constraint in this case is you see these parallel lines. The constraint is if you see parallel lines in the projected image, you're not going to consider the possibility that they're actually not parallel in the real world. And again, statistically, the, the odds of being fooled by that are, are completely negligible. So here's how it really is set up. Um, this part of the room, the person's farther away. Uh, this part, they're closer. And so when you look through the peephole, uh, this person on the right looks much bigger than the one on the left. And again, people use this in movies all the time. That's why a wizard in Lord of the Ring looks about twice as big as a hobbit, uh, because they're controlling the relative distances uh, in much the same way that the Ames room does. Um, so let me just end. Uh, I've talked about this slide a number of times. Visual space is strongly coupled to patterns of visual stimulation, but the information these provides is almost always has some degree of ambiguity. And then the question on the floor is, uh, how do we resolve that ambiguity from the ecological optics? And the argument I would make in many instances, not, not all of them, I don't want to make this a universal claim, uh, but observers typically resolve these using statistical regularities that are strongly coupled to the natural environment. And so it's that pattern of sensory stimulation that's the glue that makes our phenomenal world make contact with the physical world. And who the hell cares if it's distorted? I think this is the one point that Gary and I agree with one another. Right? It doesn't matter. Right? It may be distorted, but we can adapt to that distortion really er easy. And um, if you want to ask me questions by that, I'd be happy to answer them. But thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, questions. Uh, all right, go ahead. You're, you're up for, actually, are there any students who are be interested in asking a question? Don't be ageist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll commit that mistake. So, go ahead. Christian, can you write a textbook? I'm sorry? Can you write a textbook about all this? This was great. I love the talk. But, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I, the question I asked you about the whether or not you ever see cases where people get it right. Um, Sometimes. Right. Uh, because you, cause I was thinking at that point, well, that's kind of a hard task, especially if you want them to get a Euclidean answer, right, where all the things are equal and so forth. And, and then when you gave the explanation in terms of the Horopter and binocular disparity, then it made me think, yeah, OK, look, we, especially as, as, as a philosopher, when we're reporting phenomenology, we have this kind of sense that that's ah, this kind of read off of some kind of aspect of consciousness that should be direct and available to us. And you know, the more I learn about be human behavior, I realize that to do a lot of these tasks requires extracting a lot of information. We don't have access or understanding of what we're doing. So when you ask me to do this kind of straight line thing, I don't realize that I'm drawing off the horopter, right? or maybe that's how I'm doing the task. And so, and, and for a lot of these tests, I don't know what the information that I'm extracting is, right? So, do I want to make a claim about phenomenal space, or do I want to make a claim about how t the complexity of generating the output in these judgments, and what you're showing us is that the judgments depend on lots of very complicated factors that I don't have access to in terms of how, what the computations are, what the information processing is. I shouldn't actually talk about phenomenal spaces. I should talk about the judgments that I'm making with respect to the world that I access, which is filtered in terms of an ambiguous you know, sensory stimulation array. So I largely agree with what you say. OK. Um, I, and there are some cases, like let's say the fully experiment I reported where they have to adjust these angles to look like they're 90 degrees. I've done experiments like this. And when I talk to the subjects afterwards, they say, um, uh, can I borrow your sheet? Yeah. Right? So they say, well, all right, I see the angle changing when I adjust it like so. But I don't know what a right angle is. <laughs> right? They don't, they don't have any way of, you know, what the hell is 90 degrees to them? They don't know. So they, they, they make up a set point. And different observers set up different things. So that, that's clearly the case when you're doing something like judging angles. When you're judging straight lines, I'm not so sure. I mean, they, they look straight to me. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty basic task. Um, I mean, when I look at the data afterwards, they're obviously not. But in that case, I, I, I really feel like I'm making a, or when I judge lengths of different intervals, right? I mean, I, I, I'm, Judging what I see, it's not like I'm not sure what I see and I have to make something up. So my answer to you is both of those happen. Sometimes I'm judging what I see and I make errors. Sometimes I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to judge. And you force me to adopt some criterion and I do it. Yeah. I, I, I'm wondering why we should have a disjunctive view of what's going on there as opposed to saying, you know, what you said in the right angle case is true across the board, that is, and we're just overconfident in the straight line. Uh, that's, wow, that's, that's, a po that's a possibility. Well, we're obviously overconfident. When I just the straight line, I'm sure I'm judging it right. That's right. Um, I'm not. Uh, by the way, which is, I'm, I'm glad I'm talking to a bunch of philosophers, because if I was talking to a bunch of perceptual psychologists, they'd be all over me, right? They're, Where's Alex? He just walked out of the sky. Of course, the way he's mad at me. Right? <laughs> he went to pull his hair out. <laughs> okay, Chris is next, I think. Oh, so I just wanted to go back to uh, Wayne's first question about: um, Are there are there any tasks where we get, say, Euclidean structure uh, and met metrics right? Um, and I was just wondering about blind walking and say. Okay, let's do two things. So are there tasks where that, so let me clarify what I'm saying. We clearly understand Euclidean structure, right? Well, I'm sorry, we take that back. We clearly understand metric structure, not necessarily Euclidean. The, so what, a, what metric structure is, a metric in a space is the thing that lets us compare distances in different directions. So the metric of Euclidean space is the Pythagorean theorem. 
All right. Now we clearly under right. So if I if I say to you, um, let me borrow your thing again. You know, which line is longer, this one or that one? I mean, you can do that. Uh, phenomenally, you'll say, God, that's a really hard task. And the variability on that judgment will be really large. We actually, in psychology, we have a way of comparing precision of judgments called a Weber fraction. So in other words, how, what is the variance of the setting relative to the magnitude? And so things that you're really good at, um, like 2D line length, or bisection, you know, you have a Weber fraction of like 1%. Uh, you do Euclidean length, you have a very Weber fraction of like 25%. I mean, that's in the range of smells, right? You're not very sensitive to it. But we, we conceptually understand it. Now, let me get to the case of blindfolded walking. Um, blindfolded walking, you don't require the observer to judge distances in different directions. Right? So the idea is, is and I can do this, um, I'm going to look at your nose, all right? close my eyes, I'm going to walk into your table. Um, there's a table in the way, but uh, the phenomenon of blindfolded walking is what you do is you mark a point on the ground. Um, I'll, I'll take the edge of his uh, bag there, all right? and I'll close my eyes. And um, right about there. Um, and we're really good at that. That doesn't require knowledge of metric structure, right? Uh, first of all, you're not comparing distances in multiple directions. Um, uh, all it requires is that I have some mapping between how far I'm walking, some sense of distance at all, right? I have to e equilibrate uh, my action with the perception. Now, there are lots of experiments that are really fascinating. Um, so I do these in my class all the time, where you put on distorting spectacles, right? So all of a sudden, your world has changed dramatically, right? So the, the easy ones to do, I can do in class, where it shifts everything to the right by a couple of feet. And I have people point to it. They adapt to that in like 10 trials. More serious ones are where you um, uh, put on glasses that turn the world upside down. And you got to be careful doing that because a lot of observers will immediately throw up when they put these things on. Um, but um, I had a, a friend when I was in graduate school who wore these for about two weeks and uh, this replicating a famous experiment by a guy named Stratton. And uh, I asked him when I was young and naive, I said, you know, was there ever a point when you adapted to this that the world suddenly turn right side up again. And he looked at me and he said, no, of course not. I just learned to deal with it. <laughs> right? I think this gets to Gary's point. Uh, you know, a distorted binocular disparity or whatever other information you use, right? It's better to have that in terms of your adaptive success than it is to have no information at all. It's not that big a deal if our sensory information is distorted in some way. We, we can cope with it. Now, that sounds right to me, but um, there's one thing you were saying that um, uh, I'm, you know, maybe you could explain a little bit, and that is we don't have any sense of distance in various directions, but I mean, um, Lemmis' experiments involved, you know, kind of walking, uh, so seeing the thing directly in front of you and then walking, say, to the left, uh, and then... They're much more variable and have a lot of constant air. Actually, Bill Warren has done uh, even more experiments than Jack has done on this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to tell his story, but... You read my chapter. I'll, uh, yeah, I addressed it in that chapter. So, okay. uh, yeah. yeah well, okay, so I think you're next. I, I don't know your name. So, and then for you. I think so. We, did you had your hand up at the beginning? Right? I, I didn't. Oh, okay, then it was free. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I have a follow-up. My question was a follow-up to Wayne's face. Uh, if I understood the question correctly. So in, in one way to, to be skeptical about all of this is whether there is one subject matter that is being studied. So we assume, like, here is the geometry of the visual field. It's one 
there, is, there should be some sort of one geometry that gets studied. I don't believe and, that for yeah, a second. I, yeah, I know, I know you don't believe that. Uh, but but uh, there is a sense in which uh, we perform the experiments with that presupposition in the background, and then if we don't get consistent results, we say there is no consistent geometry, as I think uh, the, the, most of the research on this has come down to. But another way to think about the results of the experiments is that we are actually, uh, because we are, we are dealing with, with, the, with the domain where there are a lot of compounding factors, we, we shouldn't even expect uh, some sort of convergence on a, on a result. So even the idea that there is no consistent geometry is problematic because there are multiple phenomena that we are, we are studying, and maybe each of them have some sort of con consistent geometry. And the idea to put them together and look for whether there is a consistent geometry for a uniform, unified thing is, is, was problematic to begin with. Uh, so if some of the judgments are influenced by metacognition, some of the judgments are influenced by the ambiguity between the, the, the objective and, uh, and uh, non-objective readings of the instructions, all of these factors influence, then the question is how much should be, can we even, like, how, are we entitled to drawing any conclusions from these observations? But I, I was wondering how you would react to this form of skepticism about this project. Um. What you described is largely what I believe. Um, I wouldn't say that there's, let me be careful on this, because the geometry depends on the information that you're using. <coughs> All right, so if you're looking at binocular disparity, there's, there's a geometry that deals with that. If I'm looking from those motion displays, right, I can do the ecological optics, I can analyze how it is that the patterns of motion relate to um, uh, um, the patterns of velocities in the optical projection, and I can analyze how um, my judgments are relating to the pattern of velocities. Now, the reason things look coherent is because we have the benefit of humans, right? We've evolved lots and lots and lots of mechanisms for dealing with lots of different sources of information, right? And, and they, they all have their idiosyncratic uh, structures. Now, there are a lot of people who feel really uncomfortable with that. I, I personally don't, right? It's said, wait a second, you know, that means I got to have 20 models to analyze visual information, you know, one for this source of information, one for that. Um, so there's, there, at least among perceptual psychologists, there's a, there's a desire, I should say, that there really ought to be one overriding structure that binds it all, you know, like the, the master ring and Lord of the Ring that controls all the others. Um, I, I don't think there is one. I tried to structure my lecture today. Uh, in the way that people have proposed that there's an overarching structure that summarizes, and, and to say, you know, it, it's just not there if you do careful experiments. But, but when we say, like, visual space, for example, gets compressed along the depth dimension, or when you say something like it's, it has intrinsic affine structure, at least taken at face value, what you're saying is attributing a, a geometrical feature to one thing that you're calling visual space. And the skeptic might might get off the hook right away and say, "Well, first tell me what is this visual space that you're talking about?" Uh, All right, let me that? let me be absolutely clear of what I so most at least the first two thirds of my talk. Um, in that case, I was specifically relating to judgments along the ground in an open field, um, and so most of the time when people are talking about visual space, that's what they're talking about. Uh, unless you go to the real classic literature and they're doing that in total darkness, so all they have is stereo. Uh, that being said, uh, you can use the same kind of logic in specialized situations. So apply it to linear perspective. Uh, you can apply it to shape from shading. Uh, you can apply it to motion. And e in each one of those applications, you get a, a different kind of analysis, right? So the, e the ecological optics is a bit different. Right, and so you know, you analyze each one. You say, "All right, here's what's available in motion displays," and then you say, 
then you ask the question by running an experiment, does this describe how people judge these motion patterns? Okay, we got, we got six questions in 10 minutes, so there's less than two minutes per question from here on forward. And Alex, I'm going to ask you to defer to Susanna, if that's okay. Okay, so thank you very much. So I, I um, this was extremely fascinating, and I, I like what you wrote on this last slide. Um, um, but I'm not going to speak to that. I have, um, uh, okay, so, so I, wanted you to, I wanted to ask you to say more about this um, point in the second third where you talked about extrinsic mapping being not a fine and intrinsic mapping being a fine. And then I may or may not have a follow-up question. And, but before I get to that, I also just wanted to say a very minor point that I think doesn't have a lot of repercussions for your talk, but it made me uncomfortable that you used phenomenal space and visual space interchangeably. Um, I don't think it affects anything you said here, but it strikes me that there's a lot of information for, information that's relevant for the visual space and our you know, behavioral and whatever reactions to the information in the visual space that isn't going to um, you know, bubble up, to use a very helpful metaphor, to the um, level where it's relevant for what's available to me in phenomenal consciousness. Ah, I got you. So phenomenal space being conscious. Somehow. Visual ordinary. space, not necessarily. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, okay cool. I, I ordinarily wouldn't use phenomenal space. I would use visual space. Right. I was simply adapting to the terminology okay. that <laughs> you philosophers were using yesterday. So I was, I was, <laughs> I, I, I know you always get in trouble when you try to do that because you're going to use the terms in ways that, uh, We'll come back to bite you later. <laughs> anyway, so the, my, 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 I mean, my question was really just, um, can you say more about extrinsic mapping being not a fine versus intrinsic mapping being a fine? Especially just what you mean with extrinsic and intrinsic there, and then I may have a question, follow-up question on that. Okay, so let me be clear. Extrinsic mapping, I'm evaluating the structure of one space by looking at it from outside that space. All right? And so if we apply that to the famous example of this was uh, the Greek mathematician uh, Aristophanes uh, calculated the circumference of the earth um, based on the length of the shadow of the sun, right, at noon in Thebes and in Alexandria. And Apparently, depending on how you calibrate the distances that he used, the, the length of a stadia, which is the unit of measure, then apparently the Greeks and the Romans used different ones. He got it pretty accurately. That's a classic example of extrinsic geometry. He's using the sun, right, to calculate the circumference of the Earth. As opposed to what Gauss is talking about, what makes it intrinsic is you can't leave the space that you're in. All right. So whenever you see somebody saying, all right, I've got this thing in the physical world, and I've got subject subjective judgments, and they're related in a particular way, that's extrinsic geometry. Um, intrinsic geometry, in the sense that I'm using it, as opposed to the sense you're using it, you're totally confined to subjective space. You do one judgment, you do another judgment, you do a third judgment, you do a fourth judgment, and I structure those in a way that I can test a theorem, like Vernon's theorem or Pappas's theorem, uh, and these are the theorems that are the basis for either affine or projective geometry or um, Euclidean or elliptic geometry. Okay, so here's my question then. Um, so given what you say on this slide, where you have this strong, you know, externalist commitment. There are these, um, you know, sensory stimulation patterns. They're not random. They're, you know, dictated by what's actually out there in the world. Even the, you know, the intrinsic guys, the ones that are sort of stuck in their space, they're going to be subject to these um, sensory stimulation patterns. So, so their judgments are going to be informed by those. And even the extrinsic mapping guys, they're evaluating. So, there, so some kind of, um, you know, observer, uh, uh, you know, there, there's going to be an observer's share in what they're saying, too. So, I mean, I see the difference you're making, but it strikes me as that difference isn't... The difference is, I mean, in this case, right. it's purely methodological. All right, okay. Right? Right. If I can step out the side of the space, I can do it. Okay, right? okay. Um, so, uh, this very young study, I mean, we did this 20 years ago. Right. 
This is the first time I've ever talked about it in public. Okay. Why, is that, why did you wait so long? Um, because I know from experience that when I talk about intrinsic geometry, eyes roll back in their heads. People really have a hard time getting their arms around. And you philosophers, I have high expectations for you. Right? The people, perceptual psychologists have a really hard time wrapping their arms around. Right. Why would you study space in a way that ignores how it relates to the visual world? Right. And that's a good question. And the, the answer I would give if you asked me that, why would you want to do this? My answer would be, because I can. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm not enough of a philosopher to appreciate the intrinsic, this intrinsic um, business. Um, because just given that part, and given the evaluation part, it seems as if the intrinsic, extrinsic business you're talking about is less clear cut than you made it out to. Yeah. Keep in mind what I was trying to do in this talk mm -hmm. is there's no one way of thinking about visual space. I gave you three. Right. Um, and none of them is unique to me, right? right? They're, they're all the intrinsic one. I mean, you know, that, that's a pretty small literature, pretty arcane literature. Um, but it's out there, and it's been around for over 100 years. Uh, the main reason I wanted to talk to it is that if, if there are a lot of people who get these things totally confused, right? So when, whenever you hear somebody talk about the curvature of visual space, they're not talking about how it relates to the world. They're talking about an intrinsic invariant. Right. Um, I have less than 30 seconds for questions. I'm going to skip to Angie, who's not asked the question yet. So. Uh, it, it's just an observation that, of course, the prediction of the horopter depends greatly on the distance from the observer, and that the prediction based on the horopter can be made quantitatively based on the interpupillary distance and the geometry of the stimuli. My question is simply this. You invoke the horopter to explain the curvature of visual space. Have you tried to quantitatively ma ma um, model your results using the known interpupillary distance of the observer? Um, or done experiments monocularly? Well, it's worse even than you suggest, because the horopter is really a theoretical concept, and it depends on what you think the coordinate system on the back of the eye is, right? So there's a Wieth-Muller horopter, there's an Aguilonius horopter, they make different predictions. Um, but always the distance, at greater distances, the, the interpupillary distance is smaller compared to the display, and so the effects should be smaller. Um, I was telling people earlier that I made a vow when I was young that I would never study stereoscopic space <laughs> uh, and, and, and color vision. And uh, one of the prime reasons for that vow was reading about the horror opter. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a really god-awful mess, so um, you, you caught me in the act of taking liberties with it. But, uh, however you want to conceive of binocular disparity, right, that you're going to get that curved manifold that but whatever you think disparities are. Further away. I'm sorry? It would be less curved further away. No, no, it's more curved further away. But the prediction based on, on the horopter would have to be... Oh, 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 I see what you mean. Well, they're, they're a couple, of, right? I mean, you can have very distance. You can also vary the visual angle. Um, don't, we really want, don't okay, want to go yeah, here. Yeah. This is, I mean, you can get in the weeds really fast. Okay, I'm going to just to ask you, uh, calling on people who haven't spoken much. Uh, uh, you're next. Yeah. Uh, so, so my, my question is, uh, what, what is your view concerning how relevant statistical particularities are, are there? Is it worth the talk you talked about the law of generic views and the assumption that visual lines, that, 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 that uh, straight lines, Visual space corresponds to straight lines in the world. Um, explaining how the regulators are learned is easier. If there's a good mapping. If, if, if there isn't a good mapping, are there many mappings? Then that's, that's a really good question. The ones that I showed you, these really outlandish ones where you're seeing ridiculous things, uh, my view is they're hardwired. They're learned over millennia of evolution, not through our uh, perceptual experience. I don't have any hard evidence to show that, but I, I would, Carl, you think you get these same illusions in kids? Yeah. 
about people that have had uh, congenital cataract that's been. Yeah. So easily, maybe you know, one or two more. So. Oh, um, my one's just really quick. So I was just wondering about the extrinsic mapping stuff. So, um, so you mentioned that visual space good evidence it can't be an affine or objective mapping. Is there any evidence of systematic distortion with respect to topology or ordinal properties? Um, or would you be happy saying that, well, topology is pretty much preserved uh, from the physical world to visual space? Um, yes, it has to, with, well, with some provisos. Um, so, yes, and I also think the ordinal structure is preserved. That, by the way, is necessary to, um, if you consider these distorted lensing things where you adapt. Um, so what you need in order to do that is to align your motor system with what your perceptual system is telling you somehow. We do that all the time, right? And that means you need an error correction. So if I'm, if I, right, throw a ball at you and it lands three feet short, yeah. Right. I need to know, do I have to give it more force or less force the next time around? Right. Um, so uh, now the reason why it's a proviso is that in a strict technical sense, they're not topologically equivalent. Well, depends on how you want to count, right? I can't see the back of your head. Um, so if that's part of the physical topology, it's not part of my visual topology. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Jan may have some views on that. I, I, to a first order approximation, I would say they are topologically matched. Some philosophers and, and you've got to have some ordinal structure to do error correction. Some philosophers think in some reading, you do see the back of my head, but uh, not directly. Look at David, last question. Um, yeah, so I admire people who think about visual space. I mean, I can't, I can't figure out color. <laughs> um, but I, I, I just wanted to make the following observation. I don't think, I think I'm more or less agreeing with you, is that for, there's all kinds of weirdness in how uh, our color responses relate to the physical properties of the environment that cause them. You know, for example, wavelength discrimination is much finer in some regions of the spectrum and much coarser in others. Nobody ever calls that a distortion. Right? There's, there's no expectation that these would line up perfectly in the color case. And the focus is understanding how we respond the way we do and how that generates useful information about the world. Not that there be some kind of literal kind of get that very structure into my head thing. And a lot of, I'm not saying this is your attitude, but a lot of it's what it seemed to me like you were arguing is this that the visual perception of space is a matter of somehow getting physical space as in itself represented is the wrong way to think about what's going on. Does that seem? Well, A, I, you never catch me using the word representation. Right. Um, you know, I won't make fun of you if you use it, but I mean, I wouldn't couch it that way. The, I, I actually made two vows when I was young. One was never to study stereoscopic phase space, which I, <coughs> I, I didn't keep that vow, but I made another stronger vow. I would never study color vision. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have kept that one. Uh, so I'm, I'm telling you this as someone who's a non-expert on color, but the sense that I get is that color is different from things like distances in that there is no physical property color. It's, it's mostly a phenomenal property. I mean, we have um, reflectances, um, you know, so I guess you can ask the question, I, I, I won't stop on this, I mean, I... I so, I, I don't think, I, I, I probably disagree with you, but I actually, that's not actually behind my question. My question is, when people think about color vision, it really is, here's the physical world, here's the stimulus, Here's what we do with the stimulus, and what we're interested in is as we're characterizing the response and also understanding how that might be useful for us in guiding behavior in various ways. And so, and so, and so left out of this is the idea that somehow we need to mirror some pre-existing structure in the world exactly. If we don't do it that way, somehow something's gone wrong, we were distorted, 
Well, let me let me take let me take a different take on this because I think there there are two ways to do color vision, right? There's the classical view, right, where you know you have these patches on a what do you call those things they used to present them on? I'm sorry. Yeah, Maxwellian view. That's what I was looking for, right? And and they're really dealing with pure phenomenology. Um, as opposed to there's a different way of dealing with color where, you know, what I'm interested in are what are the reflectance properties of this actual surface and to what extent does it remain invariant when I change the lighting, when I change the direction of view. And that leads you to a whole area of material perception which is a lot more analogous to the stuff and a lot more complicated than the stock stuff that I was talking about in terms of spatial properties. Um, Jan is probably the world's expert on this, uh, on both of these aspects of color vision. So I, I do some work on perception of materials, but I, I have not done anything in the sort of classical kind of color vision. So I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit handicapped for the answer. <laughs> Cut this off while there's still 10 minutes for coffee. So thank you. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, excellent. <laughs>